Recently, our client John met his banker to discuss plans for a clean energy building. What he found was a shared passion for building something more, momentum for change. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. Tonight in Arkansas, there's a mother tucking in her daughter and turning off the light. A business owner is burning the midnight oil. An at-home dinner date is plating up possibility. And it's all happening under one roof. How? The power of a conversation. Like the one John from Integrity Solutions had with First Horizon Bank about his vision for a sustainable mixed-use building. Now it's not just words, it's life. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. If you really like this episode, please support our podcast by going to patreon.com slash true crime wives and get lots of great extras. On the podcast and our YouTube channel, Murder by Design, we have been discussing missing persons cases and other cases that have gone unsolved a lot. Lately, the focus is on missing children and the dysfunctional families that usually surround them. The case we're talking about tonight is a little different from those, but it is ultimately about a missing young woman. What's different about this case is that a young woman was found relatively soon after she disappeared, but she wasn't identified for a very long time, and the case went unsolved for almost 30 years. This is the story of a young woman who for many years was known only as Tent Girl. It was a decades-long mystery that gripped a small Georgetown community. A woman found dead and wrapped in a tent off US-25 in 1968. She was known as Tent Girl until the late 1990s when her true identity was discovered. And now we're hearing the untold story of just what it took to crack that mystery and how Tent Girl is helping others. LEX 18's Brianna Gilroy has tonight's Mystery Monday. And the body was right there. The tarp-wrapped body of a nude female now called the Tent Girl. I just knew that somebody out there missed that girl somewhere. Somebody's got to know that she's missing. It was a murder mystery, capturing the Georgetown community and even catching the attention of a young man from Tennessee, sweeping him up in a dark obsession. The first time I stood here was in 1987, and here it is 2015. I'm hearing it's different now. Back in 1968, Todd Matthews' father-in-law discovered the woman's body wrapped in a tent and dumped off US-25. The guardrail wasn't here. The roads changed its shape slightly. No one knew her name, and for decades, she was called Tent Girl. And when Todd heard the story, the factory worker turned into an amateur detective. There were times that we would call people. You know, I tried calling colleges, universities, churches, you know, just emailing them, whatever I could do to try to find more information. But it wasn't easy. Todd says he was spending money to come up to Georgetown and investigate. He says then a series of eerie dreams kept him going. Todd says the reoccurring dreams always involved seeing the woman's face, but one was especially chilling. Now, of course, I asked her, you know, you play along with it, you know, who are you? And she said, cut me out and you'll know. And so we did. The next, the next moment of the dream, she was lying on the couch and I had a butcher knife and I was cutting through the bag. And I could, I could, I could still feel the tension of the material through the handle of the knife. I could hear it cutting. When Todd woke up, he realized he had gone too far to turn back. The scary part was, the thing I can't explain, the butcher knife was laying on the couch. So at some point during that dream, I actually got up. And that's when I realized this, this could be very serious, this obsession, haunting, whatever you want to call it. And it's, I think it's what drove me to continue to find her. Whether it was the dreams or his determination, Todd eventually identified Tent Girl as Barbara Hackman Taylor, 11 years after he first heard about her and 30 years after her murder. Todd found an old newspaper clipping written by a woman looking for her sister, and DNA tests confirmed her sister to be Barbara. And I think if I continued without finding her, I think I'd really be in very serious shape right now because I would still be in that factory job, still be spending money that I didn't have trying to put her back. Todd still visits Barbara, who feels like family to him now. While her mystery is over, he says he now dreams of something else, helping others identify their missing loved ones, like Tent Girl. Well, I know it's going to change a lot of things for a lot of people. On the Good Wife's Guide to True Crime, we discuss crimes that some may find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised.
Hey folks, it's time to grab your glass of wine because the good wives, Fancy, Colleen, and Christina are about to serve up another true crime case. So this is a a super crazy story. I mean, I can't imagine you know, having a body and it going unsolved for like 30 years, them know, not even knowing who she was. That's how I feel like three decades, but it's also one of the stories that gives me a good feeling and it gives me hope because in, in the end, you'll see how just one person who takes it upon themselves to care about an unknown person can make such a huge difference. Well, and that there is just, it makes me sad in one way that this girl's Mm -hmm. poor girl, she's found. It's not like the body was missing and, you know, there, I mean, there must have been family that was wondering, but that the body was there. There was at least the, you know, she was dead, Mm -hmm. but that nobody identified her. That's what makes me sad because there is. Everybody is a daughter, a son, a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, cousin, friend. They're everybody right. is, belongs to somebody. And that this, she wasn't somebody for a very long time. Well, you know, I mean, I think it's interesting that when we talked about, when we, when we talked to Todd, you know, I, I live here in Kentucky. I'd never heard of this case. Um, I didn't know about it. I didn't know anything. And I live in this area, this exact area. And, you know, when he started talking about the fact that he knew her or no, knew of the case through his, his, you know, uh, wife's father, and he'd known about it since he was a kid. And he was just always really, really interested in it, you know, and figuring out who this girl was. And I, I just think that that's interesting because I mean, if it hadn't been for him and him taking an interest in it, I, you know, they may never have figured out who she was. Yeah. And it's, it's, if you guys haven't listened to our interview with Todd, go check it out. He's amazing. Yeah, it's a great interview. He does. He's he's the former director of Namus, uh, Namus, and he does a lot of work with missing people and identifying missing people and making a database for making for identifying all people that are either you know unsolved cases or missing. And I think it's just he is he's very it's a very noble cause that he is working. You know. Don't go anywhere. The good wives will be right back. Every great podcast needs a great website. Currently, our mother company, Mad Ginger Entertainment, is building their website using Bluehost. Bluehost is one of the best and most affordable web hosting platforms available. Plans start as low as $2.95 a month, and you can even integrate it with WordPress. So if you need your own website or affordable web hosting, grab our discount link in the description and get your podcast a bigger presence online at low, low costs. said we're, we were doing the case tonight of tent girl who um is was in a kentucky area and her real name though is barbara ann hackman um but she was found by a gentleman named wilbur riddle and on may 17 1968 wilbur was out by eagle creek um it's along i-75 in george County. Kentucky and he was out searching for glass insulators so when the workers go out there to repair like the phone lines and things they would leave usually leave like these behind in a bunch and so he would collect the insulators he would paint them and then he would sell them for profit and so he's just out there moseying along this poor guy you know out there looking for something so that he can make a buck to to take care of his family 
and he comes across this poor, poor girl, you know, and, um, it's just that, God, can you imagine I, just, I've never heard of, you know, glass insulators till this case, I guess I'm very naive. So these, <laughs> this. Well, you're not the only one because I'm a lot older than you. And the only way I knew what these were is I, I'm in a group on Facebook that's like a secondhand vintage group where people ask for help identifying things. And I've seen these insulators and I was like, what are these things? And people would ask like, hey, I found a bunch of these in my grandparents' basement when we were cleaning out the house. What are they? And someone finally answered their old glass insulators and basically said the same exact thing. Like, oh, the, work, the repairman would go out and work on the lines and they would take out the old insulators, put in new ones. Mm -hmm. And usually they would just leave the old ones behind and they became somewhat of like a collector's thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, and they sell for a lot of money, depending on what people do to them. You know, like, I, I've seen some of them that are like thousand fifteen hundred dollars and they make like lamps out of them and chandeliers. And I mean, they're they're big. Yeah. They're really beautiful, too. I yeah, mean, and they, they come are. In, yeah, they and if they paint them, I mean, they're gorgeous. They light up and it glows. It's it's gorgeous. They're gorgeous. Um, it's kind of like a uh, you know, have you seen the mason jar things like that where they make the mason jars into like chandeliers and stuff or they hang them in the um, trees for like a wedding, for like a rustic yes. style wedding? And then do like, like, yeah. like the fairy lights in them. That's what they're kind of like. It's 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 reminiscent of that. Um, and they are very pretty yeah, once, you know, you do something to mm -hmm. them. And mm -hmm. yeah. I've seen some very, very you know they make them i've seen one that they make into like a desk lamp mm -hmm. that's like an industrial style right right and i just they're they're super pretty and so if you guys are wondering wh what the hell are these why are they just out so like on top of the telephone lines like where you see them mm -hmm. um at the big poles and sticks up on the top that all the wires are connected to that lays across it it's those glass globes yeah um and so if you ever see these telephone lines, take a look up. Yeah, so that's what they do. They So what was happening was is when people would go out to fix them, they would just throw them on the ground and leave them there. Um, and so he was like out, you know, he's collecting them. So it's it's late morning. It's around 11 a.m. And he's just walking along the, the interstate, you know, and he sees something over the fence and off the highway in a location with like, you know, bushes and brush and everything. He gets a closer, he goes over to get a closer look, to get a better look. And it appears to be like this large green bag or some kind of rolled up tarp. And it's wrapped all the way around with like this thin cord or wire, you know? And I bet you he was thinking like, oh, maybe it's copper wire or something like that, you know? Um, right, something to actually want. And like, right. oh, I could potentially get this and sell this. I've never seen this before. And copper right. wire is a hot commodity. If you ever have one of those big box TVs and you leave mm -hmm. it in the front of your house, be prepared for somebody to smash the inside of that TV. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So Always there. But so Wilbur pulled on the bag and it kind of rolled a little bit. He even got closer. He opened up the bag. And then a f imagine being hit in the face with this scent of decay and if right. you've never smelled a human body that's d decaying it's it's horrendous there's nothing it's like horrendous. it yeah. i've i've been to aut autopsies i've been to mm -hmm. cadaver labs yeah uh it's it this as soon as somebody passes away they start decaying mm -hmm. it it just happens immediately so right. he was hit with that smell and he had he knew that he was smelling death, so he ran back to his vehicle. He drove to a payphone because this was before there were cell phones. Right. Well, way before, and, like 1968. So yeah, way before <laughs> cell phones. Before an idea. Right. And he gets on the phone. He calls the Scott County Sheriff's Department. He speaks to Bobby Vance and tells him that he he knows he found most likely a dead body. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that call, Bobby Vance was the deputy coroner and called deputy coroner Keith Grant and deputy Jimmy Williams. And they met Wilbur and he brings them back to the scene where they, he found that bag. So it was a smart decision for him to not continue to open right. said bag. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like, it was, it was like definitely a good thing that he recognized that smell. Like I know mm -hmm. they say once you smell it, you never forget it. So 
once he recognized the smell, he knew right away, I guess, not to touch anything further because he absolutely did the right thing. Right. But then once they um, open up the bag, well, the bag of the rolled up tar, they found the badly decomposed body of a young Caucasian woman. That she was about five foot one and 110 to 115 pounds, and she had short reddish blonde hair. They estimated that she was between 16 and 19 years old, and she had been dead for about two to three weeks. Oh. So she was found completely naked, other than what appeared to be a towel around her shoulders. Her body was doubled over, and her fists were clenched. But she had no stab wounds, no gunshot wounds. So it was pretty obvious that she was a homicide victim, but they had no idea how she was killed. Wow. So she's that badly, you know, decomposing and her fists are clenched. Like, you know, if she's doubled over and her fists are clenched, you got to think, what was the last moments of her life like, you know? Yeah. Like, just, oh, just tragic. The, well, and remember, like, this is May in Kentucky. Mm. Like, it's getting hot. It's not just and getting she, hot. It's outrageously it's hot. hot by this point in time. Yeah. Yeah. May is hot. And, <laughs> then being there for that long, like, just... Use your imagination. Oh, can you imagine? Oh. If you watch CSI. Right. <laughs> right. My favorite episode of that, by the way, a small side comment, is that there was a girl who, or a guy, I can't remember. It was found in a duffel bag out in the like desert on the side of a road. Uh-huh. And they opened up the bot, the bag and the corner, uh, he, or I think it was group. No, to the other corner. And he's like, yeah, it's human soup. A lifetime of hard work. Children laughing in the kitchen. Family photos on a restaurant wall. A legacy that lives on. It all comes from the power of a conversation. Like the one Tommy Hall had with First Horizon Bank about taking over his father's Charleston-based restaurant business. Now the table is set for a whole new generation. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Tommy. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. When I was diagnosed with cancer, it felt like my whole world came tumbling down. Patient Advocate Foundation is here for you, providing free one-on-one -on -one practical support to patients with a cancer diagnosis. Call us at 800-532-5274. Patient Advocate Foundation can assist in navigating disability benefits and health insurance options. PAF also helps in accessing vital services, medications, and financial resources for both medical and household expenses. Visit patientadvocate.org or call 800-532-5274. Oh God, yes, I remember oh. that one. I remember that one. And there was one on bones that was like that too, where like like she opened up something and it just like it was like goo. Like yes, oh, yeah. I remember that one on oh, bones. Oh God! And every time they showed everything that she was doing with it, I was like, oh, that's so gross. That's just so gross. And you know, it's so <laughs> funny. It's so funny. Like I can watch that in real like in real cases i can look at all that stuff but when you do it and it's like one of the fake ones i don't know it just seems much grosser to me for some reason i don't know oh i, I just I, you know what i'm like that also i can look at like really gory photographs from, oh, yeah. from cases and autopsies right. but on tv i'm like oh god why do they have to show that <laughs> and my, my son will look at me like are you serious you're asking why they showed that it's a tv show like, I've seen you look at so much worse. And I'm like, no, it's just different. It's, it's different. Just, it's I don't different. know how to explain it's different. Very different. Well, that's like my right. husband does, My husband doesn't understand that any time, like, we're watching something and there's, like, um, an intravenous drug going in, like, I'm like, I can't look. I can't look. This is, I can't. What? I can't look at this. Like, I, and, like, we were watching Pulp Fiction, you know, and they do that whole scene where he's drunk. And I'm like, I can't. I can't. Tell me when it's over. Tell me when it's over. What, like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, I just, I can't. I, well, I have a big thing with needles, but... You know, it's really funny. Like, I don't care about other people's blood, but I really can't watch my own blood. Like, I can't even go in and have my blood drawn and watch. I have to turn away. Like, I am a baby about needles and blood of my own. I can go look at anybody else's blood. I can watch my kids have their blood drawn, but not me. Not me. I can't watch my own. So, I don't know. It's weird. But, yeah, I, I'm the same way. I watch those shows, and I'm like, oh, why'd they show that? Can it really? Did we need that? I didn't need that. It's so funny. I don't know. Anyway. Uh Okay. Sorry for that. I mean, you guys like when we talk dish. So. <laughs> this is what that's we like. Makes, I mean, that, but that's what 
makes us us? Like, I mean, we could just report on this crap and be like, okay, so today, da, 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 you know, and then nobody would care. That's, that's not fun. So or yeah. they can read. Yeah, we, right? give our, we give commentary. We give that's commentary. We We're colorful. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, nice way. that's a very nice way of putting it fancy. well i was i was yelled at the other day on my facebook account for using colorful language by a woman that said that i that that showed that i could not buy, i could not use the english language in a better way that i was unable to express myself differently i said no woman i just i just feel that passionate about it that regular words just don't suffice like I couldn't yes, believe my, I was... my theory on the colorful <laughs> language is mm -hmm. it's kind of like seasoning for food. It makes <laughs> it makes your language a little bit more, you know, like you have more emphasis on it. And right. It, it enhances what you're saying, just like seasoning. Yes, I agree with you. And you know, mm -hmm. people that use colorful language like that, that use the cuss words, they usually ha are supposed to have a higher IQ intelligence. So. I don't know. That's what I've heard. So through I'm studies, I have heard that too. Total geniuses I have here. Heard that too. Yes. We're all geniuses. That's it. <laughs> geniuses. Oh, and, <laughs> and as for all of you people who uh, want to know, every single healthcare worker cusses and talks shit about you immediately <laughs> after you're out of earshot. So including the, pediatric nurses. So you don't servers. think that they swear people? Like, oh my God, saints. Yes. Yeah, we're saints. But that doesn't mean that we can't swear. We swear a lot. So do a servers. Lot, lot. So do servers. That's what we yes, do too. Yes, I know we're all servers. Yep. <laughs> and then all the inside the human secrets language. here tonight. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. The Good Wives will be right back. What if you could be a true crime detective right from the comfort of your own home? Dispatch is an interactive serial mystery that unfolds over several months. Imagine the experience of an escape room in your own home, a new kind of escape called Dispatch. It's a subscription box that's a step apart from everyday entertainment. Better than a book, more engaging than television, think of it as an immersive mystery where you wear the detective hat. The story begins with your first delivery or dispatch, if you will. In it, you'll find physical clues that lead you to the web and back to the real world to unravel a mysterious crime. Grab a friend, the whole family, and your thinking cap and get ready to put your heads together for one mind-bending ride as additional details are revealed with every package. Head over to our Instagram at www.instagram.com slash truecrimewives and click on the link in our bio then choose the dispatch button to start your own true crime adventure today. So poor Barbara, she's found. They don't even know how she was, you know, how she was killed. They know nothing about what's going on. They don't even know who she is. They take her body to St. Joseph's Hospital in Lexington for more tests and an autopsy. And the unidentified woman has no poisons or toxins in her system. Uh, there is a slight discoloration of her skull. And this leads investigators to the theory that she must have been hit in the head. And she was probably knocked unconscious. And then she was wrapped up in the green tarp. And she basically died of suffocation. So they were able to get just one fingerprint from the badly de decomposed body. But they really had nothing to compare it compare the print to and you gotta remember this is back in 1968 so you know we don't have big databases or anything like that so i mean they're just they don't know what the hell they're looking at well the investigators knew that identifying her was going to be difficult and then this is where the name tent girl comes in there were two reporters that were covering the case at the time and they pretty much dubbed her with the nickname tent girl because of the material that she was wrapped in so it was kind of like a tarp or some type of nylon that like a tent would be made of. So being that they already know they're going to have a hard time identifying her, uh, about two weeks after she's found, they bring in Harold Musser to help. And Harold is a sketch artist with the Covington Police Department. So he studies her autopsy pictures and he puts together a sketch of Tent Girl. 
and the sketches of a pretty average looking young woman, there's nothing really about her that stands out or is unique. It, it's just like the body. There's no scars. There's no birthmarks that would stand out to help identify her. God, that's so sad. Like, you know, you don't, you don't think about that. Like the day and age we live in now, you think about, oh, well, a person goes missing, a body's found. It's super easy. You just take some fingerprints, you put it in a database. Voila, you have a person, you know, and TV makes it seem so easy. Many times it's still nowadays, even with all modern technology, it still doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to figure out who that person is right away, you know, but at least now yeah. there's a better chance, you know? Well, and now we have, yeah, you know, we DNA. have so much more. You know, once a person goes missing and a family member reports, even if it's, you know, a week later, mm -hmm. the police then go, they, you know, take a look around, they take some sort mm -hmm. of thing, like a toothbrush or even right. a hairbrush to get a hair. But hair mm -hmm. is not most reliable, guys. Sometimes the TV shows, they're like, look at the hair follicle. It's, nah, mm -hmm. <laughs> hair's dead, not really any DNA. You got to have the root. Long story. You need more like a highly saturated DNA context, like a toothbrush. And, but they'll take really anything they can get. And then they will have that, they'll enter that DNA into the database too, along with, so that way when somebody, you know, finds an unidentified person, they mm -hmm. put them in the database, then they usually can make that connection. Kind of like what they do with um, felons and people mm -hmm. who are booked right. into the system, that there's their fingerprints, there's their face, there's some DNA. So that way, if a case like that, or they can hit with the missing or crimes that are in the system that haven't been solved, and then be like, oh, that guy is in the system, his DNA matches, his fingerprints are on the gun. Right. He might be involved. Right. I mean, but it's still there. I mean, there's still questions. It's difficult. Things. It's yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Hella difficult. And just because there's the DNA match does not mean that the case is solved. You I, actually I mean, have to have a case. And even now, like even with all the digital like age progression and everything, I mean, still, it's still hard because it's still only an idea of what you think a person might look like, you know? Okay. So that's what, let's add some lines here. Let's put a, you know, let's put some darkness under her eyes there, you know, but it's not, it's still so not 100%. Yeah. It is. So anyway, the sketch is released across the state and it brings in like hundreds and hundreds of leads. A, a trucker comes forward and he tells police that he had picked up a hitchhiking couple and about a month before. And so he thought maybe that might be tent girl. Um, but he ended up kicking them out of his truck because they were arguing a lot, which is why he thought maybe, you know, that that was tent girl. And she did seem to resemble the sketch um, and fit the description. Um, it seemed like a promising lead, but police ultimately determined that the hitchhiking woman is not tent girl. <sighs> so, I mean, it's hard. Yeah, you yeah. want things to be solved. You want right. it to be easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it was cool that the um, leads came about for mm -hmm. who potentially it could be, but it's right. It's not always a match. And so there's also a lead on the towel that was wrapped around her shoulders, um, which is. So really super interesting why the hell there's a towel around her shoulders. So someone called in a tip that the towel could have been a piece of a towel from the bathroom of Noble's restaurant. Huh. A very interesting lead. Yeah. Like it could be from this specific restaurant, piece of the towel. Okay. So the police went to investigate it. They asked questions and showed the sketch, but nobody recognized her. And further testing, actually, on the towel showed that it wasn't a towel at all. It was a cloth diaper. Oh, why would a cloth diaper be wrapped around her shoulders? I mean, it's, maybe... It's one of the many mysteries of, of this case. Right, maybe somebody ha has a child and they are using cloth diapers. And but still, why is it wrapped... they to bind her in some way. I get... I mean, have you seen the size of cloth diapers? They're rather small. No, I don't know. Like that's where I guess they were saying a piece. So like at first, when I when I first found that out, you know, a piece of a towel. I'm like, what do they mean a 
piece of a towel and then when it turns out to be a cloth diaper i'm even remembering back like we used to use cloth diapers for my son but as little burpee pads Mm -hmm. okay and i'm like okay that's not big okay well that well yeah like a cloth diaper when you think to the size it's not i mean i guess maybe a hand towel would be a similar size so maybe they Mm -hmm. thought something like a hand towel but i don't know wrapped around her shoulders it's it's just strange but it took them a while to figure out that it really wasn't a towel I mean, I don't See, understand why they would think it was a towel. Even still, it wouldn't have the right. Consi- that, that's a weird. I'm thinking it was like degraded, you know, because of the sure. body fluids. And yeah. If you see a piece of cloth, then it's thicker. You might well, think it's I'm a just, towel. I'm just trying to figure out why it's wrapped around her shoulder. But I guess maybe, like you said, Christina, like I use those too, you know, as a burpee cloth. Like I'd throw it over my shoulder and put the baby yes. to burp her, you know. And so maybe. That's, I don't know, maybe that was what, uh, God, that's so weird. I'm, I'm thinking that, like, she was in a bag, so I'm wondering if maybe they just threw, a, you know, a used diaper in there. Maybe that's how she just ended up getting wrapped up, you mean? Like, the, the cloth yeah, diaper like, happened to be in there, and it just happened to end up in the shoulder area when they unraveled her? Weird. Right. Huh. Interesting. Well, anyway, over the next few years, there's, there's <laughs> no new leads. And in case, and the case goes cold. So, I mean, you know, Tick Girl, she's, she's bare, and this is so, this is so, so, so sad. She is buried in Georgetown Cemetery in 1971. So several years even after she was found. A local company donated the headstone and it is inscribed, Tent Girl, found May 17th, 1968 on U.S. Highway 25 North, died about April 26 to May 3rd, 1968, age about 16 to 19 years, height 5 feet 1 inch, weight 110 to 115 pounds, reddish brown hair, unidentified. Like, how sad is this, that this is what is on this poor woman's gravesite? Like, I well, it's it's like a missing or identified thing in a newspaper. Like, found, lost dog, brown yeah. lab. Found on Highway 6. Right. It looks like it's spayed. No collar. Yeah, really, <laughs> but really But that's sad. what it's like. Right. 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 And then I guess on the opposite side, there was an engraving of her as she looked in the police sketch. So they don't... And so for decades, that this stone was the only marker on her grave. And the local police, they, they or the local people which of this is sweet. You know, the local people, they take care of her for her grave and they make sure that it's, you know, always in this pristine condition. But I mean, it's, it's so, oh God, so sad. I think this is even worse than like, if you were just sitting out there wondering where your family member is for 30 years, like this is a, a, a town that has a woman that has been found like this. And they just, they don't even know, like, there's no way to even no. identify anybody or to think what did she go through or why was she here? Or what happened to this poor girl? Like, you know, I mean, so sad. And 16 to 19 years old, like, oh my God, just. Wait, she's a, she's a teen. Yeah, just thinking teen. about it. Yeah, just just thinking about it, like I get chills when I think about it because it's like, okay, you know, somewhere there's somebody that is missing this person, and right. at the same time she's found, it's like she belongs to nobody, but then she ends up belonging to everybody because the people in this town took it upon themselves to make sure that her grave site was always beautiful and always well taken care of because nobody knew who she was so it was like I'm sure everybody had that like that heartbreak inside of them like somebody is missing this woman somewhere mm-hmm. yeah. and it's just it's sad it it's is sad right you never think about that like the ones who go unclaimed who they who you never know who they are you know we always talk about how somebody is always someone's mother or daughter or sister or friend or whatever and that you know these people are important to somebody even if they're not you know even if they've got themselves into like drugs or prostitution or any of those things you know and we were just talking about that when we interviewed the mother of of 
of Jesse Foster and her mom, you know, Glendine talking about how, you know, her, her daughter's case wasn't taken seriously because um, she was marked as a prostitute, you know, and I've heard that we've heard that over and over again as we talk to people about these cases. And, but this time, you know, you're like, we don't even know, like, there's no, she's, she's not, it's not like she's just unclaimed, like, there's not anyone to even try to give her to be claimed, you know, I just, well, right. It's <sighs> like back in this time period is what I always think of is, mm -hmm. you know, teens who ran away from home or who wanted to move out to California or Washington, or they went away to college far away from home. When I was diagnosed with cancer, it felt like my whole world came tumbling down. Patient Advocate Foundation is here for you, providing free one-on-one -on -one practical support to patients with a cancer diagnosis. Call us at 800-532-5274. Patient Advocate Foundation can assist in navigating disability benefits and health insurance options. PAF also helps in accessing vital services, medications, and financial resources for both medical and household expenses. Visit patientadvocate.org or call 800-532-5274. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. And then the parents don't hear from them again. Right. And then they're like, well, maybe, you know, they're at college and she, she doesn't want to come home or doesn't want us to be in contact with her. Mm -hmm. She ran away and wants nothing to do with us. It, to me, my, one of my favorite books when I was a teen, Go Ask Alice. Mm -hmm. Very indicative of that is, you know, a girl gets, you know, messed up in the wrong crowd right. and wants to go and run away and goes out to California, drug addict, prostitution. And eventually finds, you know, she gets home and then goes away and she eventually passes away. And right. it's sad, but it's that time period. It was in the 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. So it, to me, that's what I always think of. Right, right. And so, you know, the next thing, when we come back, we're going to talk about how she's actually identified and how the person, this is how we found out about this story, was actually speaking to the gentleman who now does so much work with missing people, but it started off with this young lady and identifying her and, and just kind of his obsession with this case and how he, you know, he came about, he was one of the very first considered web, very first web sleuths. Um, and, and he is the one who eventually solves this case and or at least solves it to a point. So, um, so don't, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. The Good Wives will be right back. So you often hear NCS Good Wives sipping a glass of wine. And one of our favorite wine clubs is California Wine Club. California Wine Club only works with small wineries and they hand select two bottles of wine each month and ship them straight to your door. Now you don't even have to go to the liquor store to have a sip of bubbly with us. How cool is that? We absolutely love hearing from our listeners, and we'd like to invite you to send us a question for us to answer or a case you'd like us to cover. You can drop us an email at goodwivesdish at gmail.com, and we might feature it in one of our next episodes and give you a shout out. We look forward to hearing from you. Welcome back. We left off with Tent Girl being buried in 1971. And, you know, now we move forward. It's 16 years later. And it's Halloween, 1987. And a group of friends are hanging out and telling scary stories, like every teen does. And mm -hmm. one of the friends is Lori Riddle, Wilbur's daughter. And that night, Lori tells the true scary story of her dad finding Tent Girl 20 years in the past in 1968. Her friend, is 17 year old Todd Matthews. He hears the story and is intrigued by the mystery of Tank Girl. And over the years, Todd and Lori start dating. They end up getting married. And Todd is still intrigued by that story that his wife told 
about Tenkro and finding out who she is. So he spends hours upon hours, like thousands of hours investigating <laughs> on his own, determined to identify her. And then he starts a website, tenkro.com, to bring awareness to this case. And now and he, remember, this is <laughs> in basic internet times. Right. Well, he said he actually started before the internet. Like he would, he was like on his bicycle riding to, you know, the library to look something up or riding on a bicycle to go talk to somebody who thought that they might know something, you know? So like, this is, he, he dates, you know, pre-internet and now he's on like, you know, dial up internet, you know, like the screeching, you know, right? <laughs> and he's searching through. And then he said, you know, for a lot of time, he was like searching through microfiche at the library. So, I mean, this is, this is a crazy amount of effort he puts into this. Like if it hadn't, I don't think if it had been for him, I don't think they would have ever closed this chapter, you know, and how interesting is that, that he just happens to date a girl whose father is the person who found this girl so many years ago. So not only is he able to bring closure to her case, you know, but he really gives Wilbur closure because it had bothered him all these years of who is this woman that I found, you know, who is she? Um, and he felt responsible for her in a way. Both of them did. Um, well, and, I, and it's, go ahead. And I think that's interesting, you know, I just really do. And it really plays a point about how much one person can do. And even if you don't think something is important, but you find it a little suspicious, remember it, write it down, report it. Even if you hold on to it, don't forget it. Right. Because one day it can matter. And it matters to a, you know, a woman who's dead. And how one person makes the difference. Right. And it's, it's really, I mean, if it not been for, you know, Wilbur and Todd, this would never have happened. And it's, yeah, it's a it, good that's thing. That's why I say it's, it's such a sad, sad story, but it's one of those that gives me hope. Right. And it, it makes me feel like what we're doing is there is a purpose in what we're doing and we can mm -hmm. help people and we will help people. And look, this is one person who at 17 years old, pretty much had almost like an obsession with the case. Like, nah, this person can't go identified forever. I have to find out who this person is. Right. And so in 1998, Todd comes across a post on a missing person's website. A woman had written about her missing sister. And Todd felt that this might be the elusive tent girl. And he contacts this woman, and her name is Rosemary Westbrook. And he, you know, with the information about Tent Girl, he talks to her and she says, yes, I do. I believe this is my sister. And she contacts the Scott County Sheriff and the, they confirm parts of the descriptions matching, including a gap in the top front of her teeth. And so the police decide that they're going to exhume the body in order to now, because it's so many years later, they're going to go ahead and extract DNA for analysis and a potential match to family members. Uh, Cause in 1998, that was pretty much how DNA was working. Like, you know, you had to still have something to match it to. There was a bunch of, you know, you still weren't doing with like huge databases and everything yet either. You're still, you're still kind of, you know, in the very early ages of DNA. Right. Rudimentary. Right. And yeah. so a match was made on April 26, 1998. And the sheriff's office confirms the identity of Tent Girl as Barbara Ann Hackman Taylor. Well, when Barbara disappeared, she was actually, I know they estimated her age to be 16 to 19, but she was actually 24 years old. And she was married to a man named George Earl Taylor, and he was a traveling carnival worker. And when she disappeared, he had told people that Barbara ran off with another man and left him and their kids. And her family, as soon as they heard that, they were like, no, absolutely not. She would never leave her children. But because Barbara was an adult and there were no signs of foul play, the police couldn't really do anything. And her husband was telling them like, hey, she left me. She left me with the kids. She left me for another man. I like, I don't know what to tell you. So after that, the police leave him alone pretty much. And he packs up and he takes off with the kids. 
Right, because they just travel, but, so. Right, and so, I mean, that's a normal traveling lifestyle, but then just remember that they found that cloth diaper. Right, right. It's, it's, that's why I felt like there's a child somewhere involved. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, there, nobody has cloth diapers unless there is a child. Yeah. You just, you know, just own them for fun unless you collect old things like I do, but I don't own cloth diapers. <laughs> Now, if, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that George Taylor had a daughter from a previous relationship. And then when Barbara and him got together, they had, I know, a daughter and I believe possibly a son also together. And they were raising the children together. So years later, the daughter of George recalls that the night before her stepmom or her, well, who she knew as her mom disappeared, she woke up and her mom and dad were struggling. And she says that it looked like her mom was trying to get away from her dad, but her dad was holding her down. When she fell back to sleep, she woke up the next morning, her mom wasn't there anymore. And in October of 1987, George Earl Taylor, the husband, who was the prime suspect in her murder, ended up dying of cancer, and he took his secrets to the grave with him. Wow. Well, and thanks to our good friend Todd Matthews, Tent Girl's gravestone, gravestone now has her real name on it, and that's Barbara Ann Hackman. They chose not to put Taylor on there um, because once they found out, you know, what had happened to her, they believe, you know, he was an abusive husband and he basically killed her. Um, you know, the d poor daughter didn't even know what she was witnessing. That's so sad. Like to think that she, all these years, she just thought her mom ran away, but you know, I'm sure in the back of her mind, as she grew older, some things had to begin to click in her head that what she had witnessed, you know? Well, right. And if the, her dad was abusive to her mom, I'm sure that he found another woman, mm -hmm. the same patterns. I'm sure you know, yeah. men went not going to pro totally project, you know, every man, but right. in an abusive relationship, mm -hmm. it usually isn't, he's just abusive to the wife or girlfriend and not the children. It's right. Like, well, even I if it's emo after, not emotional, it's I, there. I think um, after he left with the kids, it wasn't that long after that he dropped the kids off with family members. And from what I understand, he only saw the kids maybe twice a year after wow. that for a while. And then I think it like tapered off to where he just didn't see the kids after that anymore at all. So I, I wonder if that was just like a thing, like, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And if right. they don't see me, they, it may not, you know, it may not come back up in their memory, what they remember from that night. So let me stay away. All right. Yeah. Maybe he right. didn't want to be involved that much to begin with. Maybe, you know, and that right. they yeah, had probably kids. Probably the primary, home. yeah, primary. Well, character. you know, I mean, that carny life that's the carnival carny you know circus performer life that's a hard life it was not a glamorous life back then they didn't live well you know they they were always kind of you know transient and a lot of people didn't like them and so i mean there there was probably a lot of of guilt there like you said and it just he's probably the type that didn't really want to be tied down to all of that, maybe, you know, and he thought, okay, well, I've got this woman, she's what, she's taking care of my kid, then they had kids, and, you know, you don't know, but I, I'm sure that there's a larger story there, and sadly, we'll never know all of that, you know, because, because he went to his grave, and he died of cancer, yeah. and took everything to the grave, but. Don't go anywhere, the good wives will be right back. If you've been listening to our podcast for a while, then you might have noticed some changes. And that's because we recently switched our hosting platform over to Buzzsprout. And we love it. We couldn't have had a smoother transition. Buzzsprout made it super simple and gave us amazing features we weren't getting before. If you've been thinking of hosting a podcast or you're looking for a new host, then we recommend giving Buzzsprout a try. Buzzsprout is hands down the easiest and best way to launch, promote, and track your podcast. Your show can be online and listed in all the major podcast directories like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more within minutes of finishing your recording. 
Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. And if you follow the link in the show notes that lets Buzzsprout know we sent you, and it gets you a $20 Amazon gift card if you sign up for our paid plan, and it helps support our show. Um, but thanks to Todd, you know, um, Todd started the Doe, the like the Jane Doe and John John, John Doe network. Um, he worked with Namus um, for a long time. He just kind of stepped down from them recently, um, and we just were able to talk with him lately. And he was so his work with missing people and what he wants to do and how his heart is so so amazing guys and if you you know if you want to know more about this case and other missing person cases and um even just about him and his work we did an interview with him and you definitely want to check that out but we're also going to be getting you know we're going to be launching a series with with todd where we cover some of these missing person cases especially ones that he's worked on over the years um so we're really he's got that you know, connection. He's mm -hmm. got that firsthand knowledge of working the actual case. Yeah. So we're really excited about talking with him and, and starting this new chapter where we get to do more about missing persons. You know, now we've been covering, you know, some of these, uh, that we are interested in over on our, our YouTube channel, murder by design. We've talked about that, you know, uh, Colleen and I do a Friday night, uh, video and it's usually either, you know, missing persons or, or uh, very depraved things like serial killers and stuff. But mostly it's been missing persons lately uh, because of our interest in that and trying to help, you know, and even some of our current cases like uh, Lori Vallow, who we still do not know where those stinking kids are. Like, <sighs> that one is just... Well, then we... It's bizarre. Oh, it is. And They're all bizarre. bizarre. All the... Um, all all the cases that we have been looking at lately with the missing children have all been strangely different and strangely bizarre. Right. right. Lori Vallow, Evelyn Boswell, and unfortunately the tragic case of Gannon Stout. I mean, yeah, um, yeah. Go ahead. That was the most, it was one of the most tragic cases we've covered and it yeah. recent cases. And you know, when we first covered it back in January, I think it was the end of January when we first covered it. It was very, very, you know, in the interviews with Leticia were still like, oh my God, we don't know where he is. He ran away kind of thing. And we had said we really had a feeling it mm -hmm. Leticia had killed him. And, you know, we continued to stay on top of the case and share information about it. And, and recently, just a couple weeks ago, they did find Gannon's body in Florida. Um, but even though they live in Colorado, so she had went way out of her way to try to hide his body and she is currently in jail and thank God for the investigators who really, really stepped up in that case and right. are um, hoping bringing some justice mm -hmm. for that boy and his mom and his dad and the entire family and friends who and it's a they're a military family so my mom lives actually on that same base oh. um and i've i've talked with um her about this case and um about landon and um our hearts go out to her and the entire community who's involved right. um military families are very close and they look out for each other so our house our hearts go out to that family. That was one of the wor the hardest press conferences to watch I've ever seen when they found out. And it was, yeah. you know, Landon and Al and all of them talking. I, uh, God, I cried terribly. I was at work when I pulled it up and saw that it was happening. I didn't realize he had been found at that point. And, um, and this was just, God, just right before, you know, the lockdown and everything, you know, I mean, yeah. this is, this is right before our worlds all got turned topsy turvy. And I, I remember I was sitting there and I work, you know, I work for a restaurant, um, during the day and 
I was sitting up in the front and I was looking at it on my phone and my boss heard me like literally sobbing and he came around the corner and he was like, are you okay? What are you watching? You know, and I'm allowed to watch that stuff because during the day there's not as many people that come in, you know, so um, I'm allowed to watch, you know, things on my phone and I do a lot of research while I'm there usually. Um, and he just, he couldn't, I couldn't even express to him what I was watching and he just leaned down and he put his hand on my shoulder and he's like, it's okay. And I said, no, no, it's not. And I was so saddened by that, by that case. And that case has only gotten more sad as we have uncovered more and more things with what is going on, you know, more and stuff is being released. We're still not even sure if she had help or not. Um, there is a, you know, it is, it is possibly suspected that she had help transporting him to, to Florida. So, I mean, it's just, and I, things I, you got to keep coming out. I have, I had so much hope, you know, I, I wanted to be hopeful in that case, but I, I, I couldn't be, I, I looked at it and I knew, you know, just like Colleen, you Colleen said, yeah, we, we knew. knew, we knew, we knew. Now I still hold out hope on the Vallows because that's such a strange case. They're real. Those children really could be somewhere, but I don't think they are, but there is still that just ever sliver of hope, you know, Right, that they're hiding in a cult somewhere. Right, they're hiding in a like, cult somewhere. Right. That's the the fact that that's the hope we have for yeah, that children they're hiding, out yes, there. That they're hiding in a in a cult somewhere is a bigger hope than I don't know. It is oh God. Like that's never what you want. You never want to think about children being hidden in a cult somewhere. But I guess that's better than them being dead in Yellowstone. So, you know, I'm I have hope. I don't think we're, I don't think that's going to end any better than any of the other cases that have been unfolding lately. My hope for the Vallow kids, unfortunately, is completely gone. I don't have any hope that anymore that those, I mean, I do hope still, but I don't feel that at this point, I don't think those kids are alive. I think if they were by now, she would have given up. I don't know. I think she's kind of liking this whole popular thing. She puts on her little makeup and she does her little hair and she comes to court in her little, you know, uniform. And I Did feel you like see the most recent picture of her. It looks mm -hmm. like all the Botox has worn off. And <laughs> she looks like a woman maybe like 20 years older than the woman we just saw in court recently. It's like crazy she looks difference. like she looks like a clown every time I see her. It's just, yes. it's like a maniacal clown. Like, I I feel like, like she's going to pull off a mask and like um, Sideshow Bob is going to pop out. Like, that's what, you know, like she's got that maniacal kind of like, you know, I don't. Do you remember that, that, I don't know if it was, a, I'm thinking a cartoon character and he wore the black top hat and like the black trench coat and he had the mustache and he would twirl the mustache. Oh, yes. And, and he, oh, that's who she reminds me yes. of. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yes. Well, like, it's just I, like something evil in there. Oh, there is. Yes. Every other day or every week, there's like a new like leak. Like, oh, mm -hmm. the, there last text message between mm -hmm, her mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's so random well we and just put out case, we just put them out we just put no we just put out two new things yesterday on our facebook page by proxy um which you can find our facebook page at facebook.com slash mbd true crime and i just put out two new um, pieces of the new court stuff and it's it's interesting it's some interesting stuff that keeps coming out I, and that's the thing like these three cases the the boswell case the stauk case and this val you know the valo case i i feel like it's like a, a a running for like who's gonna have the weirdest fucking case and which one of them has the weirdest creepiest smile on what day like all three of them i've never seen anything like it these these weird smiles through all of this. Like, it's just, yes, I don't understand. Yes. It. Like the only time I've ever seen that before was like, um, Casey Anthony. Casey, like, she was always, Casey Anthony. she was always smiling. And it seems like each one of them has taken different pieces of like 
play part pieces of playbook, you know, of Casey's playbook and, and put it into their, their, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this part. And then the other one's like, well, I'm going to do this part. I don't like, are they coordinating with each other? Like, okay. You know, it's, so it's scary. Like we talk about, we talk about this all the time, like technology, we have so much information now. And I, this is one of the times that it's like a double edged sword because I honestly do believe we've, people are, learning what not to mm -hmm, do mm -hmm. when they commit a crime right because now you can get your hands on everything you can sure. you know you can see almost everything involved in a case and i think for a lot of people that we're seeing now they or they think they've learned a lot and they know what to do now and we're seeing like you said little bits and pieces of it like oh that that's familiar that reminds me of casey anthony that reminds mm -hmm. me of this person mm -hmm. you know uh the little boy that was that's missing that that's another case that still hasn't been solved and they believe you know the stepmother has always been the prime suspect um kyron horman mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Remember that right, one? right. And, yeah and it's, it's like little bits and pieces of all these cases put you right. in the mind of a case mm -hmm. from maybe 10 years ago and you're like well right. how much of this did they study right yes. oh yeah well and that's like with leticia like i just feel like the weirdest part with her and maybe this is i i truly think that we may end up seeing that there was an accomplice in that case um they've they've hinted at it several times it's it's been it's been floated out there in a way and i still think back to her saying that she needed an apology, that she was going to get an apology. That, and I feel yeah. like she, I think she thought, well, ha ha, what I did was I was so good at this and I gave it to somebody else and now I'll never be connected and they'll apologize to me. And it's like, I don't know if she truly believed that she, like, like she's so sociopathic, she believes her own shit. Or if that was really, she thought she'd done such a great job that she was going to get this massive apology from people because she did such a good job of giving it off to somebody else you know like I, she's so they're all so creepy oh yes creepy. to me watching evelyn boswell just talk maggie. to reporters yeah yeah maggie. or yeah about Ugh. evelyn yeah maggie like just smiling and giggling and it's like okay casey anthony like calm your shit and, and the fact that her body was found on a family member's property right and that one, I'm still, I'm still trying to figure that one out. We haven't heard as much. They've been a lot quieter about their case than um, the others. Um, yeah. I still believe Grandma is somehow involved. Um, I don't know exactly how, and I think, but I think she is. And now I am. The more and more I read, the more and more we had originally said that poor guy, you know, that got wrapped up in it. But I'm not so quite sure, sure that that poor guy is that poor guy now. I don't know. There's things. There's things, folks. There's things, but you know. Anyway. I originally thought the grandmother was very much involved, mm -hmm. but now that I'm seeing more of the grandmother, mm -hmm. I'm kind of starting to lean toward. I think that um, Megan Boswell knew that her mom is so screwed up on drugs that she would be able to pull it off and make it look like her mom had something to do with it, just because of who her mom surrounds herself with and you know what she does. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm starting she to look at. At Megan as possibly the mastermind behind this. I don't know that she's a mastermind, but I'm definitely getting a Diane Downs vibe off of her. Like, mm, I, yes. yeah. like you know, yes. like I'm thinking that maybe this is I, whether Hunter was involved or not. I think it had everything to do with him. Like, um, mm, maybe so is a boy. Yeah, I think maybe even if he, even if it's just as slight as he made a comment of like, I'd really love to get to know you better, but I'm really not looking for, you know, a relationship with a person who has a kid, you know, and she's like, okay, that's it. Then the kid's gone, you know, like, I don't know. And the thing about that, the thing that I have the biggest problem with that, and it, it, okay, so this is where I, it differs from Casey. So in Casey's case, you know, Kaylee was very well taken care of. She always looked super cute and all of her stuff and everything, all the pictures. But I greatly think that had to do with grandma. I think grandma bought all those clothes. I think she put her in the clothes. I think she took the pictures. I think, and maybe Casey was touted out to like, you know, oh, look at my daughter and her cute little baby. You know, like, I don't think that that was Casey doing all those things with, with Kaylee. I don't think she cared. I really, I don't think she had a mothering bone in her damn body. I think that I all came from great. grandma. Now with Maggie and Megan, you know, I think that I don't know what happened because I don't see 
see Angela as being the one that was out there putting her, you know, that baby was pristine. You can look at those pictures and she was beautiful and she had bows and cute clothes and she was posed and she was always clean. There was no, there's no pictures of her like where she's like, you know, some babies were, you know, when you're not taking pictures of them for real, you know, to go out to like all the family members that can see. But when you're taking, you know, something happens and somebody snaps a shot and the baby's all got crusty stuff on their mouth or their hair is disheveled. There are no pictures like that. So she was very well taken care of. And I really do believe that that had to do with Megan because I do not see Angela doing that at all. Like I well, don't I see mean, her doing I've that. seen a couple of pictures of Evelyn where she wasn't you know, pristine. I've seen her some pictures where she's eating and all messy. And Sure. But I mean, that's different than what I'm meaning. I'm meaning like there's a difference between there's a picture of a kid in a high chair and she's messy and that's funny. And then there's the difference where like you take a, you see the kid and you know, you know, the children where their moms just like, they neglect them and yeah. like their nose is always crusty, their hair is not clean, or they've got like food caked in their mouths. There's nothing like that. Like there's, yeah, true. there's none of that. And nobody's saying, oh, she was like a neglectful mom or, you know, none of those things. So I, I just, I don't know. And I know that community. I mean, I know that she called herself a gypsy and I know that they're, Yes, they are um, interesting folks, but um, they pride themselves on being moms and wives. And That's beautiful their, and, people. And, and beautiful, even though, yeah, they may be, you know, what people would consider maybe a little slutty in their you know, and what they wear. But, I mean, that, that's, I, that's, I don't know. I just. Right. I mean, if you've ever watched My Big Fat Gypsy Wedding. Mm -hmm. Like it, a lot of people, and even some of them call themselves trashy, but they're right. proud of what they do. If you mm -hmm. look at ever at their homes, right? They are the wives. They pride themselves on being one hundred percent caretaker wives, and that's mm -hmm. what they want to do is to serve their husbands because their husbands go right. out and work and right. work very hard. But and see, their I don't homes see that. are beautiful. I don't see that from her. Like I, I she's not married, so um, I don't know what happened there because it's not like that's not the Normal. way. That's not the way of of the of the Romanov people, you know. And um, generally, I mean, yes, they get they get married very young, sixteen, fifteen, you know. Um, but those girls, they live that life. That's what they want, and they, you know, they they pride themselves on that. So I don't know. That's such a strange, strange case. I just haven't gotten my handle on that one yet. Like, as I to think what it's very really different. Going on. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. There in that are case. different, not as common you know, gypsy family, like it's very, they're not mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the norm. Yeah. I don't know. It's a weird, strange story. And I think that that's but one I of the find reasons. fascinating. Why, yeah, it's very fascinating. I think it's one of the reasons though, that, that the, the police are playing that one closer to the hip, because I think there's much more going on there than meets the eye. Yeah. So, yeah. But anyway, I mean, so we will be starting, you know, soon. We're working right now with Todd to come up with how we're going to do the uh, missing person cases that we're going to work on, work on with him. We're not sure whether it's going to be part of this, this series or if we will actually create a different um, podcast, but we'll let you guys know as soon as we work all that out. We're really excited about working with him and several of we've, we've done a lot of interviews as we've been home quarantined for a while. I think we're probably busier now than we were before <laughs> the quarantine. Yeah. Um, and we've done yes. some really, really amazing, interesting interviews that are going to be coming up here and you're going to want to stay tuned for all of those because, I mean, they are just some really great, great people in the true crime sector. So um, don't, you know, you're going to want to really check them out. You know, I know you guys aren't driving to work, so maybe you're not listening to podcasts as often, but we've got some really cool stuff coming up. So you really want to check it out. Thanks so much for tuning in and dishing true crime with the good wives. Don't forget to join our Patreon member club to get the full recipe shared tonight, inside documents and pictures from the case, bonus mini podcast episodes, live YouTube discussion and exclusive invitation to our discussion group on Facebook, and get some amazing Good Wives merch. 
Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at True Crime Wives. And for more inside information, check us out on YouTube at Murder by Design, where we're currently talking about a few different true crime cases from bullying murders to serial killers. We dish it all. Have a good one from the Good Wives, serving up true crime, one dish at a time. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchases, forward, by law, 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.